One of the things that we see within this book, the prophet Haggai, is what is known to be called a minor prophet. And often people ask the question, what is a minor prophet? Well, you have those in the scriptures that are called minor prophets because their books, for the most part, are a series of sermons and or visions, but they're not as large as some of what we would call the major prophets. Now, minor or major really is just a title that we give due to the size of the book has nothing to do with the calling of a prophet on the life of these men that we're looking at. So Haggai was considered a minor prophet. It's only two chapters here in this book, but his ministry was just as effective and as called of God by any other prophet in the scriptures. Haggai's ministry ministered to those who came out of what is known as the Babylonian captivity. They have come out of that. 70 years of captivity have transpired, and this newly returned group of Israelites or Jews came back into the land for the sole purpose of rebuilding the temple of the Lord and to restore the worship of God's people back in their land. And what we see throughout this amazing book is a call from Haggai for the people to get back to what God's called them to do. We also seen last week at the very start of all of this is what was taking place. What is the backdrop and what was happening? Sometimes we need to get the backdrop to understand the message and or the position that Haggai the prophet was in. Remember, as the people came from their captivity, the sole purpose was to come into the land and to rebuild the temple of the Lord. When we looked at the book of Ezra, chapter 3, we started right around verse 8 and we kind of began to read our way through because that's what was happening in Haggai's day. The people had come into the land. They had begun to do the work of the Lord. As a matter of fact, we begin to see that at the very close of chapter 3, there was great rejoicing. The people were excited. They were there to do the work of the Lord and they were there to rebuild the temple. Now remember, prior to their 70 year captivity in a distant land, Babylon, a thousand miles away from Jerusalem, about a four month journey on foot, the people prior to this in the land of Israel experienced a great time of worship for 424 years in regards to Solomon's temple. As Babylon invaded Jerusalem, starting in the year of 605 B.C., and by the time Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, besieged the city in 586 B.C., he laid down to the very ground the ruins of this temple. He destroyed it after 424 years. The people then taken into captivity. All they had was a distant memory of the land that they once lived in and the worship that they should have, at least at that point, cherished. The close proximity of God, the God of Israel, the one true God in the midst of his people, the people of Israel in the temple, the temple of the Lord that was built by Solomon, was now just a memory. For 70 years of their captivity in Babylon, the people longed to see the day in which they would go back to their land and in hopes of rebuilding the temple. Well, in the book of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44 in verse 28, and Isaiah 45 in verse 13, the word of the Lord said that there would be, through the prophet Isaiah, one who would be raised up by God, a Gentile king by the name of Cyrus, and this king would then give the decree for the people of Israel to go back to their land and rebuild the temple. Well, God's word came to pass. Seventy years after their captivity, the prophet Jeremiah said that the captivity of the people would be for a period of time. That time was 70 years. The time has ended. The people are in the land. Now, listen to this. As the people are excited rebuilding the temple, getting back to where they need to be with the Lord, we see the people excited. But then we also see that with their excitement, the people are motivated. They're motivated, one, because they want to honor the Lord in everything that they do. Now, remember, what we kind of did was we took a picture and we said, this is how we all start off walking with the Lord, excited, rejoicing, ready to do anything for God. Like we want to take everything on. God, wherever you send me, I'll go. It's true. We do get excited. We do get motivated. But we can all relate to the excitement and the motivation, even 
the fact that when the people of Israel got back into the land, there were some remnants of Jews that remained in the land, but they kind of intermingled and married with these Gentile nations. And they came up to the Jews and they said, hey, you guys are back in the land. You guys are rebuilding the temple. Well, guess what? We worship your God too. We've been doing this. Can we help you? They were like, no way. You cannot help us. We don't want no part. Why? Because to them, it would be like going back to what led them into the captivity to begin with. Boy, what an amazing group of people rejoicing, excited about the Lord's work. And then when this distraction or this temptation came along, they said, no, we're going to stand on the word of God. We want to honor the Lord in everything that we do. I mean, it was like the perfect new believers life. But then the Bible says in Ezra chapter 4 that they experienced opposition. The Bible says these Samaritans came and because the Jews said, no, we will not have no part with you. The Bible says opposition came and the Samaritans created opposition for them. And the Bible says that they were relentless in their pursuit, but they were also effective in their pursuit. Because they came against them and because they discouraged them so much, they even hired people against them to discourage the work. They were able to take God's people, these excited group that were so excited and ready to do everything God's way to the T. They were able to take them off course. And this rebuilding of the temple literally took about 18 years before they got back to the work. For 18 years, this work of the Lord laid idle. What was it? What was it that took God's people off of off track here, once excited and motivated to do the work of the Lord, not willing to compromise anything, but to honor the Lord in all that they would do, what took them off track? Haggai here, God raises him up to speak to this people and get them back on focus. There could be many things that took them off of track. But the number one thing that we do see here is that the people were discouraged. And the enemy was able to be effective in his pursuits and I think all of us can relate. We can't just look at them and say, boy, I don't see how they blew it. I think all of us blow it from time to time. I think we all kind of forget to do what God called us to do. We begin to do our own thing. It doesn't change our position in the Lord, but it does change how we go about doing a work for the Lord. And this is what God raised up Haggai the prophet for. Now, let's just consider the backdrop. And you might say, how do you know this amount of time and so on and so forth? Well, we know this to be true, that history tells us that the second temple at Jerusalem was built in the year 516 B.C. It's an interesting dynamic because it was about 538 B.C. that the children of Israel came back to Jerusalem. They came back to the land that God had promised them after 70 years of captivity. Now here Haggai prophesies, and the Bible gives us a date. It says this, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month on the first day of the month. Well, the sixth month is the month of Elul, and it says here on the first day of the month. Elul falls within the months of August, September, and the second year of Darius. Well, King Darius became king in 521. His second year would be 520 B.C., the month of Elul, September 520 B.C. Haggai comes on the scene to prophesy four years after his message, the temples rebuilt. But the people had been in the land. Listen to this. If this is 520, they came in in 538. They'd been in the land for 18 years and God's house is not built. The whole purpose was for them to come and establish God's presence once again. God using his people to bring about his presence in the land of Israel. So what were they doing? Well, we kind of have an idea of what probably took them off course. We probably have an idea here of what discouraged them. But let's consider here perhaps what they were doing. So look at the Bible goes on to say here, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Notice that here the word of the Lord is coming to the people of Haggai's day through the prophet Haggai. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying, this people says, 
Notice when it says this people says. God's speaking, but God is saying this is what the people are saying. The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Okay, let's just stop here for a moment and consider what's happening. The word of the Lord was spoken by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28 and Isaiah 45 and verse 13. What does that mean? When God speaks something in his word, it comes to pass. Well, we know that King Cyrus spoke this decree in 538 B.C. saying, let the children of Israel go back to their land and rebuild their temple. Everything's according to God's word and according to God's timing. God is never too late. He's never too early. He's always on time. That's what Galatians 4.4 4 says. God was on time with this. The most miraculous work that he did was giving us his son, Jesus. God is always on time for man's greatest need. He's a faithful God and he's true to his word. Now we know we can trust the word of the Lord. And perhaps some of us would say, I would never speak against God's word. Right? Well, let's read a little bit further. It goes on to say, the Lord is saying, this people says. Now, he's not just saying this people in a way in which, you know, he has no care for them. What he's saying is his people, the people are saying this. Right now is not the time for God's word to come to pass. Right now is not, it's not the right time to build the house of the Lord. Well, who set the time? God did. We don't go around and say, you know what, God, we know you're a God of blessing, but, but right now it's not a good time for you to get the glory. Let me get the glory. Let me do my thing. And then when I get around to it, I'll do your thing. That's kind of the idea here. We're going to do our thing before we do your thing. Now listen to what he goes on to say. So the Lord is saying this through the prophet Haggai. The people are listening and they know very well that the Lord is speaking about them. This people say that right now, God, why would you say that we are saying that right now is not the time for your house to be built? Now, remember, the sole purpose of them coming out of the captivity to go back to the land was to do what? Rebuild the temple. And the Lord is saying, the people are saying, because of their actions, that right now is not the time to do God's work. Listen. He goes on to say, then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? If it's not time, listen to this. If it's not time then to do God's work, is it time to do yours? You see the people, what they were doing in this period of time for 18 years while the house of the Lord lie in ruins the temple of the Lord listen to this they were building their houses God was not opposed to them building their houses but they were taking care of their land coming back into the land and doing everything they could so that life can be comfortable for them and they were doing a work that God was not opposed to but the priorities of the work were out of order now, you can't write this off and say, well, at least we're here and at least we're doing something. Listen, we know the statement. We say it time and time again because it's in the word of God. Some people say, well, at least I've sacrificed this much. Listen, what God requires is not sacrifice, but obedience. You see, sacrifice is good, but what good is it if obedience to his word is? It's not the foundation of it all. Obedience, the Bible says, is better than sacrifice. Now look at what happens here. So they said, the Lord is saying, they said, it is not time. The Lord is saying, so is it time for you guys to do your thing? What about my thing? Now listen to this. Every time we've read the prophets and we've been studying them, especially as we're going throughout the word of God in the Old Testament, I, you know, whenever I'm, have to work through these prophets I say to my myself it's always difficult to teach them because there's always a message of judgment like you blew it and it's coming but the prophet Haggai is not dealing with God's people that way as a matter of fact God is dealing with his people in a very loving way so the truth of the matter is they're not in trouble they're just misguided and God's desire 
is to bring them back on track. So repeat after me. Say, I am not in trouble. Doesn't that feel good? It sure does. You know, sometimes we read the word of God and we think, boy, especially in the Old Testament, I'm done. I am done. I've literally had people come to me and they say, I don't read the Bible no more. Why? Boy, I was reading in the Old Testament and there it is there. I'm like, no wonder. No wonder you're not reading it anymore. You're probably reading all those laws and all those things and everything that God is going to do to his disobedient people. And because you are disobedient, you're like, that's me. Well, listen, there's great portions of the scriptures as it pertains to the law that doesn't pertain to us. The law was not given to the church. The law was not given to the Gentiles. The law was given to the Jews. Now you might say, do we follow the law? Yes or no? No, we follow Jesus. And it's Christ in us who is the hope of glory. What Christians do follow that pertains to the law is the morals of the law. That's what we follow. Because the law doesn't make us right with God. Jesus does. And so what we see here is God's people being encouraged to stay within the parameters of what God prescribed them to do. So for us today, when we look at this, don't be discouraged by reading this. I'll tell you what, learn from it. Learn from how God dealt with this people and the mistakes that they made. Now, let me tell you something. I always like to learn from those that have gone on before me. And I like to take from where perhaps maybe they failed or faltered and learn from those very same mistakes. The good thing is, you're not in trouble. Amen? And neither are the people of Haggai's day. They just need to be redirected. I love how God so graciously and lovingly redirects us. So the Lord has to point out some truths. Here was the reality of the people's state of mind. You've been doing your own thing for a while now. When... The purpose of you coming into the land was to do my thing. Now, I had no problem with you doing your thing, but as long as we take care of my thing first, priorities. We looked at that last week, right? Getting things back into perspective and having our priorities in order. Now, listen very clearly. We've said this, and I'll say it time and time again. When you first take care of what's on God's heart, he'll then take care of what's on yours. Now, you know, sometimes we look at that and we say, oh, yeah, I got a lot of things on my heart I want God to do. But listen, I think David summed this up very well in Psalm 37 when he says, and, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Read that psalm and see as he kind of just lays out their steps. The first thing David says before you get those desires is do not fret. You know what the word fret means? It means to bubble up and to glow. That's what the Hebrew word means. You ever met somebody when they get mad, their face turns red? Stop it. Stop turning red. <laughs> he said, in other words, he's saying, stop losing control. Stop trying to worry about something that you cannot change or alter. In other words, God's in control. And David is saying, just let God do his thing in your life. And then remember, he says a couple of things. He says to trust in the Lord. He says to delight in the Lord. He says to commit your ways to the Lord. And then he says to rest in the Lord and he shall bring it to pass. So when you go to someone and you say, hey, God will give you the desires of your heart. You need to stop and don't tell them that because you're telling them something that's not true. How many of us have desires in our heart this morning? Raise your hand. And how many of you know that some of those desires are not from the Lord? Raise your hand. Okay. Imagine now if God gave you the desires of your heart, what would your life look like right now? Oh boy. You see, Psalm 37, just, I just want to throw this in there because what he's really saying is God's the one who puts the desires there. And once those desires are placed there by the Lord, then we speak those out and it's God's desire. So why wouldn't he give us what he wants for us? Absolutely. We can rest in the faithfulness of God. So can we be misguided? David said you can. Can you get discouraged? Of course you can. But here's the point being made. They're not in trouble. What the Lord is saying is, you've stopped taking care of what's on my heart. You see, Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, a very famous passage. And what is that? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all things will be added unto you. So what do you do first? And then all things will be added unto you. 
You seek first the kingdom of God. You seek God first. You first take care of what's on God's heart. Then he'll take care of what's on yours. Now you might say, well, the people in Haggai's day, they didn't have the New Testament. Jesus hadn't even come on the scene. It's been a great period of time here. And, and uh, what scriptures did they have? Well, let me help you with this. They had Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. They had Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 17. They had Leviticus chapter 26 and verses 3 through 13. They had Deuteronomy 28 and verses 1 through 14. Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verses 3 through 9. And all of these passages teach the same principle that Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. So they did understand to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all things will be added unto you. I want you guys just for a moment just to consider what the Lord is saying here. Look at. He says, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple lie in ruins. They built their houses. They built their businesses. Not anything that God was opposed to. See, God expected his people to no matter where he put them for them to thrive. As a matter of fact, in the book of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 29, in verses 5 through 7, listen to this. The Lord is speaking to the people of Israel and he's saying, listen, when you come into that land, you build your houses. You harvest your fields. You receive of the produce of the ground. You do all of that. And listen, I'm going to bless it and it's going to be good for you. But guess what he was saying that at? He was saying in the land where I allow you to be carried captive. God wanted them to prosper when they were in Babylon. How much more so to prosper in the land of Israel? Of course, this was God's desire. He encouraged them. Be planted and prosper in the place where you live. And this is what they were to do. In Babylon, he commanded them to do this, and even more so where they're from, their land, his land that he'd given them. And what were they doing? Yes, they were doing that. They were building their houses. But listen to this, guys. They lacked. There was a lack, and they weren't flourishing as they should. They didn't finish God's work. And so what they were doing was the lack of flourishing was a result. Listen to this. A lack of flourishing didn't mean that they didn't flourish. They flourished, but there was a lack. You understand that? They lacked in their flourishing because they ignored God's command. Let me tell you something. I don't know about you guys, but I'm blessed as a Christian. Well, okay, me and you, amen. Whoever said amen, God bless you. We good. That's it. We got our own little church going on. The rest of you, I don't know what's going on. But anyways, I am blessed to be a Christian. All right. Anyways, so Christianity is great. Wow. Okay, so I guess I'm going to stop trying. You guys get the point I'm trying to make. So I guess just a lot of you are not happy to be Christians. So anyways, let me help you. Maybe this is where your unhappiness is coming from. Is this the best of the Christian life? Well, I'll tell you what, I look at some Christians and I don't measure God by their life. I see some that are blessed, unbelievably blessed. And you know what I say? I don't say, wow, look at how blessed you are. I say, you're doing something right. And I could also have the same experience. If, and I'm not talking about wealth. I'm talking about being happy in the midst of everything. Encouraged, knowing that, hey, my life might be jacked, bro, but God is good. Isn't that all that really matters? Now, it does matter if you're the one that jacked it. But anyways, <laughs> God will teach you in this, okay? But just pay attention to this here. There is a lack. You see, many Christians come to me and they say, Pastor David, you know what? Man, you know, I'm, I've been walking with the Lord 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels. I feel like, you know you realize there's more and you know you're not getting the more. Now, I'm not talking about health and wealth, prosperity, gospel, blab it and grab it, name it and claim it, junk, false teaching. Don't pay attention to it. It's not of God. It's a distraction. But you realize in your spirit that you are lacking. Where do you think that's coming from? That's God showing you. There's so much more I want to do for you. But, but if you just get back to doing me, because there's this common phrase today, right? It's been circling around. You know, hey, how you been doing? I'm just doing me. Oh, you're just doing you? Yeah. Or how about them couples? You know, you just do you and I'll do me. Terrible thing. What you need to be doing is you need to be doing him. 
You need to be doing God. You need to be doing the things of the Lord. If we're going to say that, the Lord needs to be the center and the focus. Anything else is selfish. Who would dare go to the Lord and say, God, I, I love you, but I'm just going to do me. Well, that's what they were doing. There was a lack of flourishing because they ignored God's commands. Guys, listen. You know, God here is not chastising in the sense of coming down. He's trying to get them to understand. Do you see that there's more I have for you? You've been flourishing, but not to your fullest potential. Imagine if we gauged and measured God by how much we have. Boy, people wouldn't want what we have in the Lord. And sometimes we sell ourselves short from what we can get from the Lord. Not that we can get from God, but what he has for us. Because we're too busy doing our own thing. Just trust God in doing it his way and watch what happens. Think about it. You know, when I was there, you know, in, in, in looking at these places there in uh, Baja California, you know, the other day and and one of the brothers that was with us, he was telling one of the pastors there, uh, the pastor there, he says, this guy right here, and he pointed to me, he's like, this guy, I seen it with my own eyes. And this guy was just like, God's going to do it, I know it. And it happened. He said, I could see, I can name some things that I seen because this gentleman was showing us this house that he had bought in this house, and they're going to make it into a, um, an orphanage. And he was just kind of laying it all out and and he's just like, you know, yeah, you know, people think I'm crazy, you know, this. And the brother encouraged him and he says, no, you, 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 God showed it to you and it's going to come to pass. And you're, and you're taking the steps necessary for it to take place. And, and, and the guy was like really encouraged, like, oh, like he thought it was like a message from God. And the brother was just like, no, listen, relax. Like, I seen it. This man here, I seen it. Since I've been home, I seen it. I've seen it in this man's life and in the ministry. So I know if you're doing that, it's going to happen. Just rest. God's faithful. He already has it all worked out. We're the ones that are, you know, taking detours and getting sidetracked, man. And because he loves us, he's like, okay, you'll be back. Listen to this. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, listen to this, consider your ways. I want you to write those three words down. Consider your ways. Change the word for your to my. Consider my ways. Consider your ways, okay? So listen. So they built their houses and their businesses. There was a lack of flourishing. They flourished, but there was a lack of a greater flourishing because they ignored God's commands. And look at what he says. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. He who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Some of you are like, whoa, God, did somebody talk to him about me? Because this is my life right here. Can anybody relate to verse 6? Some of you are too embarrassed. There's no need to be embarrassed. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, okay? Listen, I can relate to verse 6. He says, you have sown much. And bring in little. So what does that mean? He's, he's not saying that you've sown and didn't bring nothing in. He says you brought something in. But you could have brought more. You eat. But you do not have enough. So you're eating. It's not like you're starving. I didn't bring you out of the captivity to starve. But you could have more. You drink. But you're not filled with drink. And you clothe yourself, but no one is warm. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, listen, you've come into the land and you are experiencing some goodness and some blessings. But do you know there's more? He even goes on to say here, you earn wages and, and you put them into bags with holes. You see, the work started well in Ezra chapter 3 in verses 10 and 11 started really well. The people were excited and motivated. The work then became idle for 16 years. They had been back in the land for 18 years, and this is what they were doing. Verse 6, building their houses, working the ground. The land was still desolate after 70 years of neglect. They were working hard, 
listen to this, guys. They were working hard. They had no money. They didn't have the full manpower. Remember, when they first came out of the captivity, not everybody came. Daniel remained in Babylon. And after Zerubbabel led the first group, you can read it in the book of Ezra. Just open it up. That's the history of the backdrop of this book here. A first group came out with Zerubbabel, and then Ezra, the author of the book of Ezra, takes another group out. And then Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, another group comes. But not everybody came. Manpower was down. How about this here? They were suffering a little bit. As a matter of fact, the Lord would even say here in the next couple of verses, he says that, that the heavens above withheld dew on the earth. There was a drought. They were suffering a bit. They also had this going on. They had hostile enemies around them. And, they, and these hostile enemies resisted the work of rebuilding the Lord's temple. But do you notice that the enemies never resisted them building their own houses or working their ground? Well, that should have made the light bulb turn on. Hello? Anytime I set to do the work of the Lord, there's going to be opposition. But when I do my own thing, the enemy just leaves me alone. That's why some of you are like, huh, trials? I ain't got no trials going on in my life. Really? Boy, and that says a lot about you and your walk. Because a Christian life is all about walking into one or walking out of one and walking into the next. That's why I don't want to be a Christian, Pastor Dave. Oh, so you want to do your thing. You want to serve God your way. You want to do it according to your will, your purpose, and your plan. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the way thereof leads to death you see God's way though it might not be the easiest way it is the best way he promises to be with us through it all listen to this guys remind yourself you're not in trouble right okay good you're not in trouble they're not in trouble all God is doing is drawing attention and he's saying do you now realize wow what are you saying Lord I could have had you could have and you can because the work still needs to get done. You know, think about it. When we give a task to our kids, for those of us that have kids, some of you have more than one, and so you give them different tasks. Like, you know, you say to one, your job is to throw the trash out. Your job is to feed the pets. Your job is to clean the room. You're and you give them all these tasks. And listen to this. All of a sudden, you're sitting there, and then the next thing you know, you realize the trash is not thrown out. The pets are not fed. Whatever, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, you yell their, you never yell their first name, you yell their middle name, and they know it's serious. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they come and they say, and then you say to them, what, what were you, I, what are you thinking? You know, weren't you supposed to do this? And they're like, yeah. Well, what were you doing? And what's there? I forgot. <laughs> well, what were you thinking? What were you, now listen, how many times have you forgot? Parent? You see the Lord up there like, what were you thinking? Well, come on, look at the trash. It's like a landfill in here. No, no, listen, when, how often have you forgotten? And what does the Lord do when you forget? He reminds you and he puts you back on track. He doesn't tell you, now go to your room and go stare at a blank wall for an hour. Think about what you did. Because obviously you're thinking about something, Right? Am I being a little bit too transparent here? <laughs> Listen to this. God doesn't give up on us when we forget. He just redirects us. And we realize, man, if I would have just did it God's way, if I would have just did it this way, if I would have just honored the Lord, then I probably could have bypassed the lack. That is true. Listen to this, guys. He goes on to say this in verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. There it is again. He repeats it a second time. Consider your ways. Now, there are three words that kind of sum up the word consider. Three words here in the original language, the Hebrew language. The first one is some theme, which means to put and to bring or to appoint. So the word has the idea of to bring something, to appoint something. Then the Hebrew word lebab, which means the heart, to to, to Leb, he says to, to bring that forward, bring the heart forward. And the last word behind that would be Al, which means to bring it above, to bring it up. In other words, consider means to examine one's heart, to bring it up and say, what's going on? 
He says, consider your ways. The word here, way, in the original language is the Hebrew word, darek, which means a road or a course of life. A course of life? Yes. What direction has your life been going and what direction is it going? It's a mode of action. And the Lord is saying, take inventory of the motives of your actions. Take inventory of your life and of your walk. Examine your heart. Where is it? The most important thing is that obedience begins in the heart. We serve the Lord with all of our heart, not half of it. He says, would you just consider your heart? This is, guys, this is not, hey, you're in trouble and I can't believe you. No, he's just saying, I want to help you understand where you fell off. They got distracted. Their priorities were out of whack. And what they began to do was they began to do their own thing because they said, Lord, right now is not the time to build your house, but we're building ours. And it wasn't so much that they were open defiance, but they were just doing their own thing. And because of that, the work of the Lord never got accomplished, at least for 18 years. The enemy grew more bolder and they understood that they were able to keep God's people distracted. Let me tell you something. The enemy will throw everything at you to distract you and take you off course. My encouragement to you is stay the course. I don't care what it is you're going through. I said it last week. Those who are in the word and in prayer can get through anything. And trust me, you can. I know I'm living proof. And I've seen many of you and many others trust the Lord in everything in their lives and his word. And you want to know what people look and they say, how? How could you get through that? Only by his grace. Consider your ways. When a person considers their ways and they realize, you know what? I've been doing my own thing. You know, it's so easy for us to do it our way. Oh, we, start, we start feeding into emotions and we start considering things that we never otherwise considered. Hey, when you first became a Christian, did you not believe everything that was written in the Bible? I mean, you believed everything. Every single little thing. You know, some people, they, they, I had a guy tell me, he's just like, man, bro, you've been, you've been, you've been reading this Bible for years. You still believe all that stuff? You better believe it like the day I first cracked it open, man. That's why I'm here. I ain't going nowhere. The thing that discouraged this individual and was so surprised that I still believe everything here is because they've allowed other things that were contrary to what's in the word of God to, to distract them and take them away. It might have been a different philosophy. Others have allowed suffering or circumstances to take them away. And others just got lazy and just stopped doing it. You ever just stop doing it? You ever just stop reading your word? And stop praying. Anybody here ever done that? Raise your hands. I'm looking for moral support. Okay, God bless you. Okay, so how did that, how did that work for you? You're like, I'm, I'm just the strongest Christian now, Pastor. I, I know what it is to not read my word and not pray. Are you serious? Your life's miserable. Once you've tasted of the goodness of God, you know, man, even if you go back, for a season and you go back to the vomit that God pulled you out of, you're not happy there. You know you got to come back, right? I mean, even now some people say, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so, that's what I'm praying for. But some people do that even sitting in church. <laughs> Boy, it got real holy in here right now. <laughs> what is God saying? He's saying to you and I today, you're not in trouble. Like he's saying to the people in Haggai's day. But what you need to do is this. Consider your ways. I love you so much that I still want to use you. And I still want you to be a part of rebuilding the temple. Now I understand you've been busy working on your houses. And you've been busy doing you. But now it's time to do me. Can we get back to this? Consider your ways. It's only then when we understand what has taken the place of serving the Lord in our lives. And we turn from those things that have been distractions or deterrents in our lives. And listen, guys, it could be anything. The Lord says, when you consider your ways. Now, here's the command. Look at verse 8. I love verse 8. Check this out. Look at what he says here. He says, go. 
He says, go up. Listen, anytime God directs you, he's not going to tell you, hey, go down, go down fast. No, the Lord says, go up. God's direction always leads us upward. It always leads us, as, as Paul would say, to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What God has for you, the direction is upward. And the Lord is saying to them, go up. Now listen to this. He's giving them direction. Remember he says, consider your direction, consider your road, consider your way. How have you been doing with all that you're going through? When you know you're doing what God's called you to do, you can, you can get through anything, man. The Lord says, go up. In other words, what is he saying? Go the direction I provided for you. He says, go to the mountains, go to the place, the direction, the place. And then he says this, and bring wood. Go get the things that I've already provided. And look at what he says, and build the temple. Go to the work that I called you to. Notice that he didn't say, okay, consider your ways. You consider them? Yeah, okay, so you know you've been disobedient. Yes, I have. So you need to sit down for six months. You need to go through a discipleship class. And we'll pray about bringing you back. He didn't say that. You considered your ways? Yeah. You realized where you, yep. Okay, get back to work. Go up. Go to the mountains. Bring the wood. Build the temple. Listen to this. Why would God be so gracious and merciful to you and me? Why? Because I'm his favorite? I am. I'm telling you guys that. Okay. And I am. He told me that I am. You haven't got there yet then. That's why. I, I read this and I believe everything in there. So I'm his favorite. And this is why he says, David, go up. <laughs> Go to the place, go get the things, go to the work. Listen to this. Why? That I may take pleasure in it. In what? In that you're finally doing what he says? No. Take pleasure in what? That he's looking good? No. Take pleasure in what? In you obeying his word. Because he knows the riches and the benefits that you will experience. And in that, he is glorified. That's why. Because what I have for you, the Lord is saying, is so that I am glorified through you. Do you see together we make this work and the Lord is saying... Can you just get back to the work that I've called? Look at what he goes on to say here. He says, I love this, guys. Look at what he's saying here. Verse 9. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. Boy, didn't you experience? I, I have. I'm like, man, Lord, I thought, I thought you called me to do this or that. You get all excited and sidetracked with something. Or you stop doing what God's called you to do because it's not working out. Listen, stop measuring the success of a ministry by its size. What if God just called you to do a little work? What if he just called you to minister to one person? Listen to this. There was a pastor at a pastor's conference, and, and they told everybody to greet each other. We don't all know each other, but the guy seemed really excited to meet me and everything. And he's like, oh, David Zamora. And I'm like, yeah, it's my name, bro. And he's just like, oh, bro, you know, wah, 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 wah. And I'm just like, oh, wah, 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 you know? And so anyway, so we get to talking, and then he goes like this. He goes, yeah, you know, I'm just up here, and oh, man, you know, it's just, it's tough. And I said, so what? He says, what do you mean? I says, well, you know, how many people you got, man? He says, oh, you know, like, <sighs> he did it all quiet. He leaned in. He's all like 75 people. And I was like, 75 people? <laughs> I did. I said it all out. 75 people? I says, you know, let me tell you something, bro. 75, that's a lot of people to be responsible for. And he's like, I says, you understand that God put these 75 people in your, you understand when you stand before the Lord, you're going to give an account for those 70. Do you understand that everything they've learned and received, you're going to give? And he's like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, 75. I should be thankful. Very thankful. Very thankful. I says, bro, that's a big church, man. And he was like, yeah. I says, yeah, you're good, bro. And I patted him on the back. Okay, sit down now. Let's pay attention. And that's exactly what I did. And you know what? He went back and he told his congregation, he said, I was ready to give up. I was discouraged. That was my last pastor's conference. And he said, but this guy, 
David Zamora. <laughs> Spoke to me and encouraged me, you know. And, go, pa -pa! and you know that now his church, he has a couple of hundred members. Isn't that amazing? And I see him now, I'm like, what's up, bro, 75? 75, you almost gave up for that. Listen, even if he calls you to those little, stay faithful. If he calls you to many, stay faithful. When you look, that's the problem, you look. You look for much, but indeed it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? <laughs> well, because that wasn't God's will says the Lord of hosts. I love that. He, even when we make mistakes, God will use your mistake to bring himself glory. Did you know that? Some of you are like, oh, I made a mistake. Now God's going to get me. Who taught you that? It's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in scripture. Yeah, there's consequences to bad decisions, but you know that God even uses your bad decisions? He's going to get, why? Because you're his, you belong to him. It's like the person you try to distance yourself from that's always messing up, Right? You know how it is at work. You're all good friends with the person that just started. And then before you know it, they're coming in late. They're messing up all the time. And everybody's like, hey, don't you talk to that guy? Oh, I don't know him. <laughs> I don't associate with that guy. You know how you are, right? <laughs> or, you know, you, you invite somebody to Living Way and you go to me first. And you're like, I just got to tell you a little bit about them. You know? Like we're related, but, but we're like, we haven't talked in like years. So does that make you not related or what? You know, it's like, you know, that's your blood, man. You know, don't, don't be embarrassed by their sin. You were crazier and just as crazy as them. So relax. We'll be all right. When they mess up, yes, I will come to you because you're the one that brought them here. But anyways, we'll be all right. The Lord never does that with us. He never does that with us. Listen to what he goes on to say here. He says, I blew it away, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house. Why did he do it? Because it wasn't his will, his house, his work. You see that? God spoke his word. You came here to fulfill my work, to do me, but you've been doing you. And he goes on to say, listen to this, guys. What God is saying to somebody here this morning is he's saying, it's time to get back to doing him. You've done you long enough. Are you tired of striving? He begins to explain to them, listen, now it's going to hit them. The light bulb's going to go on. Listen to this. Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. You see, your greatest joy is found in doing me, the Lord is saying, not you. Therefore, the heavens above withhold the dew and the earth withhold its fruit. Things are more difficult in your own strength. Stop striving, church. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. You don't think it dawned on them? We are in the land, but why isn't it the way the prophets have said it would be? The Lord is saying it's not because the prophets have failed. It's like those people that are not in their walk, you know, they're spinning their wheels. And some people say, oh, you know, you know, Pastor, I, I, you know, Pastor Dave, I want to come talk to you. I'm going to leave my church. Why are you leaving your church? Because I'm not growing. So because you're not growing, you're leaving your church. You're not growing because of you. It's not the church's responsibility to grow you. You got to grow in your walk with the Lord. But right away, we want to shift the blame on others. Well, you know, if I, if I just had a godly husband or if I just had a godly wife, then I could do more for the Lord. Stop blaming your spouse. Focus on the Lord. When he called you, he called you. I understand the two become one, but still, that's why the Bible says two are better than one. When one falls, the other's there to pick him up. Keep moving forward. Trust in the Lord. Listen to this, guys. You can't blame others for where you are, and the Lord is saying, did you not realize that there could have been a whole lot more you could have experienced, but yet you did your thing and you didn't do me? Let me encourage you guys that the whole purpose of all of this was to bring honor to the Lord. Let me give you a couple of things as we close this morning. Number one, jot it down. Here's how you can honor the Lord today. Jot it down. Number one, honor God with your time. Honor God with your time. How are you using the precious time you have been given to glorify God? 
Why did God call you from your sin? Why did he bring you out of the mess you were in? Why did he save you and deliver you from the addictions and those things that had you bound? Listen to this. So that you can glorify him. Isn't that what he said? That I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Glorify God with your time. Psalm 144 and verse 4 says this. Isaiah 58 verses 13 and 14. And Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. Second thing, jot it down. Honor God with your talents. What has God given you? God has given you gifts. He's given you talents. And these are to be used for God's honor and for his glory. They, these are your God-given gifts and abilities. Listen to this. Use them. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 25. In verses 14 through 30. Honor the Lord with your God-given talents. Another thing we are to do is we are to honor God with your temple. The Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Honor the Lord God with your temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in verses 18 through 20. Honor God with your temple. Fourth thing, honor God with your treasures. Jesus said this very clearly in Matthew chapter 6 in verse 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God has given some of us resources to use for his honor and for his glory this means your finances. Honor God with your finances. Honor the Lord with your resources. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. And the fifth and final thing. That I believe the Lord was speaking to them here. When he said consider your ways. He said bring your heart up. Examine it. Honor God with your heart. You're to honor the Lord with your heart. There are many Bible verses throughout the scriptures that encourage us to make God number one in our heart. We always read Jeremiah 29, 11, right? For I know the thoughts, the plans, but have you ever read verse 13? Honor God with your heart. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Proverbs 23, 26. And Psalm 51 and verse 10. Listen, guys. Honor the Lord with these things. You might say, Pastor David, it's difficult. It's tough. You don't understand. Well, I do understand. We understand. So did Haggai and so did the Lord when he said to his people, you've been distracted too long. What is it that's distracted you? What is it that's brought you to a place where you realize, in a sense, that it's taken my focus off of what God's called me to do? Well, according to Matthew chapter 6, in verse 24, the Bible says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, in verses 2 and 3, it commands us to have no other gods before the Lord. And Jesus said in Matthew, Mark chapter 12, in verse 30, that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. God desires to be the sole proprietor of your heart. So let him. Oh, but you don't understand what I've done. I don't need to. Here's what the Lord says to you this morning. Go up. Go up to the mountain. Bring some wood. Go build that temple so that I can get the glory. What is he saying? Nothing changes who you are. You're still my son. You're still my daughter. Little disobedient, but you're still my kid. I haven't forsaken you. Get back to the work so we can get this done.